Hi everyone, I'm Lily, a consultant at Hanoi Associates. And I'm Georgia, I'm responsible for strategic partnerships. It's great to be here today and we're really looking forward to talking you through our visions for the sector and what we see as the most promising innovations. We're going to be discussing how the cannabis consumer goods industry will develop and how to prepare for the entrance of fast moving consumer goods companies or FMCGs such as Nestle, L'Oreal and Pepsi. The team at Hanway have been operating in the cannabis industry for over six years, beginning in advocacy where our team supported the brilliant Charlotte Caldwell in her campaign that led to the legalization of medical cannabis in the UK. Our team then went on to help shape the strategies for some of the largest LPs who were looking to understand the complexities of the European industries and the fast developing markets. And in the last year, we've helped a number of large FMCG firms who are now ready to start plotting their market entry. Yeah, we've been really lucky to work with a number of amazing companies right away across the different segments in cannabis. Uh, in the last year, we helped one of our clients gain one of the 10 recreational licenses in the Netherlands. Uh, we helped one of the UK's largest mainstream food producers uh, assess the market and plot their entry. We've gained licensing deals for our FMCG clients and we've produced a number of industry leading reports in partnership with governmental bodies. Uh, we are very pro-recreational cannabis use and Lily and I spend a lot of our time discussing the interesting developments that we see across the sector and pondering what the future of cannabis consumer goods might look like. We wanted to use this session to take a step back and look at the industry globally across every segment with the focus on FMCGs moving into the space and how that will affect brands and consumers. So aside from a handful of, of early adopters, FMCGs have until now held back from playing in the CBD sector due to several reasons, including the regulatory uncertainty, still associations of stigma, and the various overhauls of the industry that have taken place, like the novel foods process. And as a result, the sector is hugely fragmented. Few brands have more than a percentage market share, and few have a presence across multiple markets either due to the differences in both the permitted product formats and the sources of CBD itself. But we're now seeing novel foods authorizations beginning to be granted for hemp derived and synthetic CBD, some of which are our clients at both the European and UK level, um, which is gonna just provide a really compliant path and the certainty that consumer goods brands need to be able to dive in and launch food, drinks and, and supplements containing CBD. Exactly. Um, as Lily said, you know, FMCGs have been dabbling in the space. The Body Shop, who have long included hemp seed oil as an ingredient, uh, finally took the plunge into CBD topicals after two and a half years of R&D. They launched globally in October last year. And as many of you will know, launching CBD products across multiple markets is a logistical and a regulatory nightmare. Um, even prominent retailers such as Aldi have started releasing products uh, with hemp seed oil and potentially CBD oil in them. And a lot of brands who have been waiting on the sidelines for the regulations to become clearer are now starting to look at the space. We saw last year in, in January, Pepsi and Monster announced that they would be ceasing development of their CBD products um, in the US after the FDA's remarks over its safety. And although they haven't picked that back up yet, we have seen Pepsi release the line of hemp seed oil drinks through their subsidiary Dash. Um, with the bigger corporations moving in, I think we have to expect a much longer lead time. Just because you haven't seen FMCGs in the space yet, it does not mean that they are not actively looking. What I think as well is really, really exciting is we're starting to see with these new categories emerging, uh, entrepreneurs taking the opportunity to build portfolios of companies. Um, a great example of this in the UK is Rebecca Hall, who spent a number of years building her very successful brand Botanic. She then secured a million, uh, over a million investment and has built a team of experts. And she is focusing on helping brands in her portfolio find a clear route to market and engage consumers with resources and distribution to give them the growth they need to actually compete with the bigger players. She is now planning to build a very strong portfolio of brands and we're gonna be watching her moves very closely. Yeah, for sure. And I think this whole movement comes with increasing awareness from consumers too. I mean, a few years ago, the majority of brands were spending a lot of their time trying to educate consumers on the difference between CBD and THC and that CBD doesn't get you high. Um, but I think consumers globally are beginning to, to move on from this and are now becoming completely aware of the different uses of the plant and its compounds. And equally, ha just having CBD in your product or, or slapped over your label 
is not enough for consumers anymore. And brands really need more than that to differentiate. The next big trend that we're really excited to see develop is the growing role of celebrities in CBD and also in recreational cannabis brands. And in the past, many celebrities have been worried about the reputational risks of, of doing so. Um, but as cannabis is becoming a lot more mainstream and, and positively viewed, we're seeing strong interest. And we, we thought it would be helpful to think about this and look at some examples in terms of how, the how involved the celebrity is in the company's operations and how they position their role in, in the public and through PR. And some celebrities are keen to take a huge role in the, in the brand strategy and the product develop, take, taking a more management or operational role. Others prefer to be a silent investor or, or simply an ambassador for the brand rather than taking such a active role in the formulation. Exactly. I think celebrity backed brands are nothing new in the consumer goods industry, but in cannabis consumer goods, we seem to have had a huge rise of influencers and celebrities entering the space. Um, celebrities are good for sector legitimacy and they help improve consumers' perception of cannabis as it still continues to shake off its stigma. Having direct communication with their large and devoted audiences is also invaluable, especially in Europe where brands are heavily regulated in what they can do from a digital marketing and ads point of view. Um, you know, that can present a real challenge when you're trying to talk directly to your audience. YouTuber Ollie White, who has over four and a half million subscribers across a number of different platforms, has been able to launch his, his unique CBD brand um, and been able to talk directly to his audience, educate them on the products, keep them up to date with behind the scenes content, and it really provides an interesting platform. Having celebrities uh, attached to your brand doesn't always equal success. We've watched as multiple brands have completely flopped despite being tied to big names. In some cases, we do see a trend, as Lily said, where the more involved a celebrity is with the brand, the more authentic they come across to consumers. My favorite example of this is Houseplant. When Seth Rogen first teamed up with Canopy and launched Houseplant in Canada, it was actually met with quite a mixed response. Consumers complained of white label products and they felt that the, it was a bit of a corporate washout. And they definitely incorrectly uh, pitched it at a bit of a premium segment. A year later, Seth Rogen went back to the drawing board and released Houseplant in California, where he was heavily involved in the curation of the brand, and he even was involved in making of the high-end accessories. The brand now has a you know, really loyal following and is, is really kind of setting itself ahead. Again, in the UK, we look at 4.5 CBD listed on Amazon, steaming ahead of the competition. George Kuris and Dominic Day have both been at the center of operations, and you can really see that starting to pay off. Um, I think we can all remember Dan Bilzerian. He's a great example that you can come to the UK. You can spend tens of thousands of pounds on launch parties and create a bit of a hype. But if you do not have a coherent strategy that speaks to your target market, you may not survive. Celebrity brands face the same challenges as larger LPs as sales numbers have failed to hit those wild predictions. And we still have a highly fragmented and competitive market. Many have had over-realistic expectations of consumer and brand needs. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I also think that how a company's connection to a celebrity is viewed by consumers has a huge part to play in their success. As we all know, consumers can see straight through a cash grab and they're increasingly looking for authenticity and, and values in their purchases. And it's just not enough anymore to have a celebrity face on the packaging if it is actually an awful product. So a well-considered approach and, and a lot of involvement from the celebrity is, is really important, we feel. Mm. So these are some examples of some of the celebrity entrants that we have seen. We're now going to take a look at where we think the sector is going to be in the next five years. So as part of our work in the consultancy, we're often working with companies across the various cannabis verticals to help to build their value propositions, position them for success in the future and build their supply chains. And we're often being asked where we think the sector is going to go. And we spend a lot of time both analyzing the current data and also the future trends and, and where we think things are headed in terms of the product formats themselves, but also for the industry as a whole. And in, in terms of the products, CBD products have often been quite generic and basic until, until now, especially for the mass market targeted products. But 
we are now seeing increasing differentiation in terms of the formats and the delivery methods. And this is increasingly opening CBD up to a broader set of people. So some examples that I think are, are great for this are EV Labs CBD micropearls, which can be taken on the go like a breath mint and deliver quite a controlled dose of CBD. And also Amura's easy to dose flower stick inhalers, which allow consumers that are new to flower and to, and to vaping um, an easy route to, to control their dose and try out the, the new method. And we also expect more advanced formats to be introduced and perfected like transdermal patches and, and powder inhalers for really targeted effects. And similar to this, we do expect some pathways to be introduced for over-the-counter products that are able to make soft medical claims that current CBD products are not able to make due to the borderline medical uh, issues and claims situation. And we think this could happen in a way similar to the traditional herbal, med herbal remedies framework that we have in the UK um, and allow them to be approved to target certain soft conditions, maybe sleep, headaches, for example. The next kind of huge trend which we see as, as playing out and affecting these markets over the next five years is recreational reform. So consumers' perspectives of recreational cannabis is rapidly changing and it's becoming hugely more accepted. There was a recent YouGov survey of the UK, which said that 53% are in support of full legalization. So definitely on the cards, and we're hearing a lot of rumors across Europe of regulators also making strides towards recreational markets. And I think a key implication of this is that we're going to see a lot more interest in the cannabis plant as a whole, rather than just CBD as an isolated compound. So I think we're going to see more interest in other cannabinoids and terpenes and, and really an appreciation of, of the whole plant as well. And I think the shift towards recreational markets is also likely to split some of the consumer segments as some consumers will move to recreational products instead of the CBD ones bought through traditional retailers and others may move to, to medical channels once access is wider um, in the coming years. And we've seen a rapid surge of countries legalizing medical cannabis, as I'm sure everyone has been closely watching. And many do anticipate recreational markets to come soon after. And this is something we're really trying to push forward at Hanoi at the minute. And a lot of the CBD brands that we speak to have been set up with the long-term intentions of pivoting into rep. And so many of them that we speak to are setting up their supply chains, their product IP, building their communities, and appealing to consumers and building that, that real loyal consumer base to gain a presence before the regulations pivot. So a forward thinking look is so important. Another trend that we're closely watching is the rise of synthetics. So both synthetically produced as well as cultured cannabinoids, including methods like yeast production, which are able to produce scarce minor cannabinoids at scale, which is not always commercially viable through extraction of the plant. And I think globally, there are still huge differences in between countries about the source of permitted THC. And this is causing huge issues of, of, of introducing a multi-country strategy. So countries such as Japan, no trace of THC is permitted, extraction only permitted from the seeds and the stems. to so the Canavape case that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, where CBD extracted in the Czech Republic was not allowed to be marketed in France. And a lot of this has resulted around the concerns about trace of THC in products and associations with narcotics being derived from the cannabis plant. So synthetics are hugely able to disrupt this and are seen favorably by both the regulators and FMCG companies who typically want and are used to implementing a multi-country strategy as opposed to a market by market approach. Exactly. Um, this next point, I just want to caveat by saying we are not suggesting any marketing towards um, underage people, but we are now seeing Gen Z become of age. And in the next five years, they are going to become um, a key target demographic for many brands. Um, we've already seen how different Gen Z are in terms of their consumer behaviors, and they're typically characterized as digital natives, very progressive, and they crave close connection and authentic experiences. They grew up around an increasingly accepting view of cannabis, and they are now opening their arms to using it in a kind of casual and everyday setting. We've started to see brands making the most of this opportunity. Um, in New York, Bowery, which is a CBD shop, uh, which also doubles as a thrift store and an art installation, of course, um, went viral on TikTok after creating a campaign for the shop's opening. They saw a need to create both an online community and provide a physical space for them to be able to experience what they discover. And it's created a huge buzz online. 
This will also come with the rise of new technologies and platforms that cannabis brands will need to utilize if they want to reach this target audience. Popular content styles like short form content are key. And we've also started to see brands in other sectors capitalizing off emerging platforms such as OnlyFans, which was recently valued at 1.7 billion pounds. Giving your cannabis brand's loyal audience access to behind the scene content and creating a sense of community for a monthly subscription cost could prove extremely lucrative, especially in the world of cannabis. It will be really interesting to see how CBD brands and cannabis brands manage to start to capitalize on these audiences and networks as they become increasingly popular. Um, we've seen a lot of brands have a lot of success uh, using things like closed Facebook groups, closed Instagram groups, and we think that will become very popular as consumers crave that direct communication. A good example of this is Geneva, which was actually launched by the CBD, um, a CBD founder of the company Rhesus, and they offer Slack-like functionality for brands with more features geared towards social groups such as uh, events and posting boards and group video chats. Geneva definitely caters for a Gen Z audience who demand to join a smaller, tight-knit group of individuals uh, that feel like they're part of something. Another trend that we're seeing that we're really enjoying is that over the last kind of year or so, we've seen a lot of brands designing for consumer need states. Brands now understand that consumers use CBD for a range of different purposes and that it makes sense to design products accordingly. We'll continue to see this develop, but with an increased focus on designing for use occasions, uh, whether that's CBD wellness retreats in the UK or in the US and Canada, where we've seen a rise in experience led retail spaces. Um, and this has worked really well in the no to low alcohol space, where brands have successfully hit consumer need states and created uh, occasion based experiences that complement social rituals. We're also seeing, and again, this is one that we're really, really excited about, um, an emergence of, of a new category. And that is um, the kind of the emergence of the high end cannabis brands and high end cannabis accessories. As we see millennials and Gen Z consumers incorporating cannabis into their lifestyles and seeing it as more of an everyday identity, we're now seeing um, these pieces really come to life think kind of really high-end, design-led, beautifully created pieces that really stand out. The same way that you would have all your liqueur and your bar and it would be on display in your living room, we're now seeing people with mid-century modern glass bongs as the centerpieces for their living rooms and their dining tables. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this myself. And how do you think this is going to, to play out on a global level? Do you think consumer tastes are going to vary by market or how do you think it's going to, to affect yeah, I think, I mean, I think there is a lot of untapped potential when it comes to recreational cannabis accessories and branding. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of different identities pop up, especially in the US on the West Coast, where they've had legalization for some time. Um, but it'd be really interesting to see these different pockets of culture start to emerge. I'm personally really excited to see the types of aesthetics that come out uh, in the New York recreational scene and hopefully in Europe in the future, too. Yeah, of course. Me too. So the next and final section that we're going to be talking about today is how to actually stand out and to make your brand attractive, both to FMCGs and how to compete against them. And I think if you want to position yourself for acquisition by one of these larger companies, or if you want to list on a public exchange like the London Stock Exchange, as we've seen companies having huge success with over the past few months, it's really important not to stray into non-compliant activity. So performing with regulations and processes like the novel food system, however annoying it may be to collect all this data and, and the costs involved, it's so important not to play dirty if this is your aspiration and you do want to be acquired by, by a large company as there will be huge audits and enforcement of this. And I think another way to differentiate, which we are increasingly seeing a focus on, is through patents and IP itself. And this trend is kind of playing out as wholesale raw materials have become increasingly commoditized. CBD isolate and flour in bulk, are, the costs are just incredibly falling and it's not where the value is nowadays. And it's becoming so much more important to focus on the IP and the methods to make the product itself more effective and appealing. And we also do expect to see more licensing agreements for the delivery method IP itself to FMCG companies and also acquisitions of companies that have good technology and formulations that can really stand out. 
Mm. Have we um, have we started to see any interesting FMCGs filing patents? Yeah, we've seen a bit of activity so far. Probably the most notable, I would say, is the Colgate Palmolive toothpaste case. So they've recently filed three international patents for cannabinoid formulations to be used in oral care products like mouthwash, toothpaste, oral gels. And Colgate themselves publicly stated they were interested in CBD's antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties. So I think this one is so interesting as we've been watching this closely over the past year since Colgate acquired the natural oral care brand Hello Products, um, which was for their CBD and hemp oil product lines and the expertise of their oral care formulations. Fantastic. Yeah. Another thing that we think is, you know, really key, and we say this to all of our clients, is having a good team is, is so important. And it's one of the things that, you know, potential acquirers and investors really look for. Uh, we recommend building a strong operational team with cannabis specific experience and people who can bring interesting skills from other adjacent industries. And even more so, we think it's great, you know, if you can build an advisory board or a team of advisors, um, again, just to strengthen your position and make you really attractive to potential uh, companies looking to acquire. And I guess we've discussed this a lot during this talk, but it really is the key is brand positioning and differentiation. You know, if you can position yourself well in the market, if you can build up a really strong audience um, that follow your every move and that are really loyal to the brand, that is so valuable for, for you know, potential investors and potential acquirers. And it's just absolutely key. Mm, for sure. And I think the, the key takeaways of all of this is that the sector is going to shift and that. The entrance of FMCG companies is no longer an if, but a when. And rather than being kind of fearful of this and trying to protect kind of small businesses, I think it's really important that instead of trying to compete at scale, smaller businesses look to develop craft and bespoke offerings and really be able to stand out in that, in that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, fantastic. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed that. And um, we, you know, absolutely love to discuss where we think the industry is going. And we love to come across really interesting brands. Um, we're going to do a quick Q&A. Um, I think we've had one question in that uh, it looks quite interesting and um, that we can definitely um, take a look at. Um, so somebody asked, do you think CBD and the broader cannabinoid products out there are strictly millennial in their demographics? There doesn't seem to be a lot of brands catering to the 45 to 50 plus market. What are your thoughts on that, Lil? Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. I think a lot of people have gone for quite a minimal approach and targeting at kind of a sleek millennial audience. But I think this is quite short sighted as a lot of the consumer research does indicate that a lot of at least the routine CBD users who are using it for maybe quasi-medical purposes, those do tend to be over the age of 40. So I think we're seeing some shift towards this, but as Georgia mentioned earlier, the companies that are targeting specific demographics, we do really think are well positioned to succeed and yeah, would encourage a lot more brands to, to start exploring older demographics and, and various genders, ages um, mm -hmm. for a really diverse targeting. Yeah, and we saw quite an interesting last year, we saw a lot of brands that said that they were targeting these demographics, they were targeting the older demographics, but that definitely wasn't coming through in their brand imagery, the platforms that they were using to communicate and their messaging. So we think that actually, you know, the companies that are quite confident to target a very specific demographic and are not afraid to maybe alienate other demographics in doing so are actually going to be able to capture a really kind of loyal market, which is really important. Um, we've got some more questions here. So somebody asked, um, Neil Cartwright asked, um, I didn't catch the name of the New York cafe online. Can you say it again? Yes. So it's called Bowery Showroom and they um, are very interesting, very, very uh, millennial and Gen Z. Uh, they do vintage clothes, they do art installations, workshops for creatives, and they are also releasing um, CBD line, uh, which they have just been announced and they are kind of opening in the next week or so. Um, we have got a, another question. I think this one will be good for you, Lil. Mm -hmm. um, someone asks, I'm in Dublin, Ireland, and I'm on the verge of starting my own CBD brand. But I'm wondering, is it too late to launch a product in the UK? It seems quite saturated. No, I would say it's not too late to launch a product in the UK, but to really consider your strategy and your positioning. I think if you want to launch maybe a generic oil or tincture, for the mass market, I think probably the boat has been missed and that's not where the value is. But I think developing a, a niche product and, and targeting a specific demographic 
there's absolutely still room for this. And although there's procedures like the novel foods in place, which often deter smaller companies from playing in the ingestible space, we do see quite, a, quite lower barriers to entry in maybe the vape segment or the cosmetic segment. And I think both of those areas have really strong potential for growth. So definitely do not be deterred and, and definitely consider um, entering the UK market, but really consider your strategy and make sure you have your supply chain and the, the right partners and, and retail outlets lined up. Yeah, exactly. And as Lily said earlier in the talk, the biggest thing as well, and we tell brands all the time is just being a CBD brand is, is not special anymore. Like we've seen it all before that, you know, having just CBD in your ingredients is, is not that interesting. And um, there's plenty of brands out there. It's what else can you offer? Like what else do you have to offer as a brand is really, really important. Um, we've had some more questions. Um, we'll do our best to answer these, but they're quite interesting. So somebody asks, there seems to be a mix of reports of the male to female demographics. Are there any concrete figures with regards to who is using CBD more, men or women? Mm. So I think in terms of CBD, I've looked at quite a lot of these consumer surveys and they tend to be around an even split as a whole. I think it's, I don't think it's personally a gender thing. That's the main divider. I think it's more consumer segments and archetypes, their preferences and interests or their age um, and what, what they do in their, in their life, what their hobbies are, what they do for work, I think are more accurate ways to segment than, than male and female at this point. But I think it's quite interesting as, as more markets emerge and as recreational markets open up that we are seeing the traditional kind of male stoner image really fall away and we are seeing an increased focus on females in the cannabis sector. And I think that's only going to be a good thing going forward. Mm. And what I'm quite enjoying is, whereas you know, we saw this big movement away from the kind of traditional stoner stereotype and a lot of the branding and design was around, you know, remove yourself as much as you can from the cannabis plant. We're kind of seeing that come around a little bit now with the kind of mm. millennial and younger and Gen Z audiences where they actually, you know, we're going to they embrace the cannabis plant and it's part of you know the image but it's just the way that it's positioned is slightly different it's more high-end it's more luxurious it's more as part of an identity so this is quite interesting to see um we've had another question which is uh which eu countries are the closest to making recreational illegal yeah so quite an interesting one obviously the the netherlands has got a kind of quasi legal decriminalized coffee shop system at the minute, but they are moving towards legal supply through the controlled coffee shop experiment, which as Jordan mentioned, we helped one of our clients to, to gain a license for earlier in the year. But in terms of other markets, there are definitely movements happening in Portugal, in Malta, and potentially also in Germany as the political makeup is, is set to change. The Christian Democratic Union is no longer expected to have huge seats in the next um, coalition government and the Greens and all of the other coalitions who are involved in, in the political situation are all have all expressed intentions to legalize or at least regulate in some way cannabis. So I think Germany could be on the cards closer than we think. Um, the pilot program is going to be kicking off in Switzerland as well, which is very, very exciting. Um, and also Luxembourg as well will be introducing their recreational framework soon. Fantastic. Um, just I think we are are uh, get in touch our email is slightly cut off so uh, if anybody would like to get in touch with us um, you know we love talking to new brands we love giving advice we love hearing about your journeys and what you guys are up to so uh, if anyone does want to get in touch with us you can either email us at info at hanwayassociates.com uh, which I'll put in the chat um, or you can reach out to Lily and I on LinkedIn we're both very active on LinkedIn um, yeah we're always up for for a chat um, I think we maybe have time for um one more question mm -hmm. um this one is yeah quite interesting as well i don't know what your views are on this lil but um somebody has asked what happened to the cbd drinks market haven't seen much of this product type in the past year mm. so i think the cbd drink segment it's been positioned for huge success a lot of people say this is maybe the future of cbd but there's been quite a few hurdles that have prevented this from taking place. The, the first one being the formulation itself. So CBD in itself is not water soluble. And so it's very hard to make the formulation not just stick to the can and to make sure that the CBD is actually bioavailable when the consumer actually comes to drink and purchase the product. And I think there's also been issues with shelf life, which has prevented this. 
we have seen some interesting formulations come out um but the the second sort of barrier in a, in a lot of countries has been the novel foods approval so as a, a drink is going to be ingested the ingredient does need to be authorized as a novel food so this has prevented the situation in, in quite a lot of markets taking off but I think there's a lot of innovation and R&D going on in the drink space. And I think hopefully in the coming years, we will see some more stabilized and approved and compliant drinks being launched across mainstream channels for sure. Exactly. Um, one last question that's just popped in, which again, I think you might be able to answer as well, Lily, but um, somebody has asked, is there a market for terpene infusions? Hmm. So this is something that we are really interested in and would love to see more appreciation of among consumers. I think there definitely is an interest, but it's not among all segments and demographics. So it's taken quite a lot of education and, and, and work to, to get some groups even familiar with CBD and trusting its safety and, and what it does. And I think terpenes are sometimes one step a bit too far, too esoteric for some people, but we are increasingly seeing brands rolling out this and, and introducing terpenes to their formulas, either trying to replicate the profile of different cannabis cultivars or trying to, to replicate any other sort of flavor in traditional products. And we have a lot of this is happening through kind of non plant derived terpenes. But I think what we are very excited to see is the more actual cannabis derived terpenes being produced and, and rolled out at, at a wider scale. And I think, yeah, this is a, a really good way to tap into the educated cannabis consumer segment, for sure. Fantastic, um, brilliant. Well, that's it from us. And we uh, absolutely loved this talk and we loved kind of preparing it. And um, it's been great to be a part of. And if anybody would like to ask us any more questions or just have a general discussion, feel free to get in touch with us um, either by the Hanway Associates email or um, via LinkedIn as well. And we'll try and do our best to respond to any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.